Thank you. Um, can you hear me in the back? All right. Great. Okay. I'm going to try and keep this uh, mic right in my mouth. <laughs> uh, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I have the distinct honor of telling you a little bit about our subtitle project uh, on, on rocky reefs, I'll call them. Uh, this project really was uh, primarily led by my postdoc, Ryan Jenkinson. And uh, the only reason he's not here right now instead of me is that he is off gallivanting around the world. I, I guess at the moment he's in Gabon doing some sort of a, a spiny lobster fishery project. So, uh, so I'm it for today. Um, what I'm going to tell you about is uh, this project and uh, the first thing really to mention that's most important um, is the acknowledgement. So I'm going to start with that today. Um, this project would, really would not have been possible without a large number of people, most of whom did the actual scuba diving. And so I really want to thank our lead dive team who did an amazing job in uh, really challenging conditions off our coast here. Uh, that includes, again, my postdoc, Ryan Jenkinson, uh, two graduate students in my lab, Jonathan Santoni and Frankie Moitoza, and Chris Teague and Brian Tussauds' lab. Those folks were uh, in on almost every one of the dives to gather the data. And in addition, they, they were joined by a bunch of uh, uh, added scuba divers here. I won't take the time to go through all these names, but I will say that every one of them was important in gathering all the data that you'll see here. Okay, so uh, where do we sample on the, the north coast? Um, there were four MPA sites here that you can see in purple, uh, starting out uh, all the way in the north here at Pyramid Point State Marine Conservation Area, and then uh, down here on the south region, Double Cone Rock, uh, 10 Mile SMR, and Point Cabrillo SMR. I'm going to really focus my talk a fair bit today on Point Cabrillo because a lot of the uh, points that I want to make today are really going to be a comparison between the Point Cabrillo protected area and an adjacent site right next to it, Casper, which is not protected. But in addition, you'll see an added uh, few protected sites nearby at Elk, Avalone Point, and one in the north at Trinidad. Okay, so uh, the methods involved, involved scuba sampling uh, by getting to these sites on uh, small HSU vessels, 19 foot and 22 foot vessels. Uh, and each site was divided into three cells and all of the uh, uh, surveys were done uh, repeatedly in each cell. Uh, at each one of these sites or cells, the surveys that were done included a uniform point contact a method for looking at the percent cover of benthic species, the habitat type, the rock type, and whatnot, and the reef rugosity, or the, the benthic relief up off the surface. In addition, there were swath surveys to look at a number of things, including the size and abundance of red abalone and red sea urchins, uh, to look at the density of macroinvertebrates and algae, and to look at the size and density of fishes uh, near the bottom and up in the water column. Uh, this next series of slides will just show you what the divers did underwater. Essentially, in this case here, what I'm showing you is the benthic diver uh, censusing fish by moving along the bottom here in a 30 meter transect, which of course for our region is completely devoid of these giant kelp, so you'll have to forgive this uh, cartoon here a little bit. Um, but the benthic diver will essentially move along the 30 meter transect type through time, and any fish that fall into this two by two meter uh, uh, rectangle here will be counted and there's a second diver above this diver doing uh, midwater sampling of fishes. <coughs> All right, so uh, I'm gonna jump next to the uh, results and I'm gonna give you the one of the big results first. If we take all of our data together, and there's a lot of data here that I'm gonna summarize in this particular uh, slide here, um, and that means that we're taking the percent cover of benthic invertebrates, uh, mac macroalgae on the bottom, uh, fishes uh, at both the midwater and uh, near the bottom, and we're combining them all into this multivariate plot. And on this plot, what you're going to see essentially 
is that uh, <coughs> points that are close to one another here are very similar in terms of their multivariate characteristics. Uh, points that are further apart are more different. And what I'm drawing your attention to in this slide here really is that we found there was generally three different regions along the north coast. There was a region that you can see here in a, a star and an X in the far north, those of course being the Trinidad uh, and Pyramid Point sites. There's a region here uh, in the center, uh, just south of Cape Mendocino, which included three sites uh, in green, Abalone Point, in light blue, Double Cone, and the uh, gray uh, crosses here uh, representing 10 Mile. And then finally there uh, was some clustering of sites in the south here, including Point Cabrillo here, and uh, bright blue being Casper, and lastly Elk. So these three regions seem to jump out as different from one another in their characteristics in terms of the fishes, invertebrates, and algae that were there. Um, so what kind of data is in that last slide? Well, this is some of the data. So this data here uh, is really just showing you the substrate type. And uh, you can see from this graph that uh, the bars here for all the different sites here in brown is really emphasizing that most of these sites were dominated by bedrock. <clears throat> what about the organisms on that bedrock? Well, they included a whole suite of uh, uh, different kinds of invertebrates, uh, everything from uh, two worms to bryozoans to barnacles. They included a lot of crustose coral and algae. And there's an interesting trend here as well that you can see uh, where if you move from the north here on the left-hand side of the slide to the southernmost sites, you see an increase here in the uh, amount of the crustose coralin percent cover. <coughs> okay. Um, so uh, we can also look uh, at individual plots that just look at a particular group. And this, this plot here shows just the percent cover of sessile and colonial inverts and the benthic algal turf. And again, what we can see here is that uh, there really was, a, a, we, we done, we've done statistical tests on this data and found there was no difference between the MPA and adjacent non-MPA sites. There was no difference between years 2014 and 15. And you can get a feeling from that on this slide. So for example, if we pick out a site here, say, elk, we can see the data uh, here in 2014 and the closest adjacent clustering here for the next year in 2015. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see. Uh, the most inf uh, abundant invertebrates here that I really want to focus attention on today were the red and purple urchins. And those were, those are seen here in this slide in red and purple respectively. And one of the things that really jumped out at us, again, is the site here at Point Cabrillo. Point Cabrillo is a protected site and has been a, a protected site for 40 plus years now. So it's a really long-term protected site and might give us a glimpse for what we might expect down the road here for all these MPAs. What are we seeing there right now? Well, in short, a lot of purple and a lot of red urchins. Okay. And perhaps not surprisingly, not a lot of algae. In this plot here, we're showing some of the stipitate, kelps, and other uh, large algae here. And you can see that uh, there's a variety of abundances and types of, of these al uh, algal species at different sites. And when we get to Point Cabrillo, there's not a lot there at all. <clears throat> OK, what about the fishes? Well. Uh, Quickly, I can summarize this slide by saying that black rock fish tended to decrease uh, as we go from the northern sites, where there were a good number of them, to the southern sites, fewer black. And the blue rock fish did exactly the opposite, where northern sites had fewer black rock fish, and there were many more here in the south, especially again at Point Cabrillo. In fact, the densities of rock fish were roughly two times that at the other sites at Point Cabrillo. Uh, so we found high numbers of purple urchins, especially at the southernmost sites from Double Cone 
all the way down to elk. And red urchins were very abundant, especially, again, at Point Cabrillo. Significantly more so, actually, than the nearest non-MPA site right adjacent to it at Casper. So uh, in summary, then, we have uh, data that shows that for purple urchins, red urchins, and red abalone, there's really a strong difference, a significant difference, between the protected site, which has been long established at Point Cabrillo here, and the directly adjacent site at Casper. Lots of purple urchins at Cabrillo, lots of red urchins, okay, significantly more so at Cabrillo, and interestingly, fewer abalone. And one of my graduate students, uh, Jonathan Santoni, is digging into this data really to look at and see if there's a relationship here. Is it the case that the more urchins you have, the fewer abalone you have? Is there evidence for competition where perhaps these urchins are eating so much of the food for abalone that the abalone have to get up and move out or die? Okay. So uh, let's see. I, uh, looks like I have a little bit more time. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take questions in just a minute. But before I do that, I'm gonna try and see if I can show a short video clip. Okay, um, so my, my divers are going to just narrate this a little bit to let you know exactly what you're seeing. So this is an example of a uh, fish transect being done in the deep water off of the uh, Double Cone State Marine Conservation Area. Uh, as you can see, the bottom is devoid of kelp. Uh, there's a high abundance of red urchins that are uh, interspersed throughout the uh, rocky bedrock habitat uh, and on that you can see a bunch of uh, metridium anemones these white plumed anemones that are uh, spread throughout but that is very typical of most of the deep waters uh, around 60 feet off of our coast uh, lots and lots of this hard bedrock whereas if it had light uh, this area is off of USOL so it's on the Lost Coast, uh, far out there, the water's usually dirty, so the light doesn't make it down to 60 feet. This is one of the reasons you don't see kelp, and if you did, the urchins would have mopped up what was left. But uh, you can actually see a couple of fish that were swimming around. These deeper reefs tend to have a lot of black rockfish. Uh, we ran into a, quite a few vermilion rockfish as well. but. Uh, the two transect lines, you can see the one that was down at the benthic diver at the beginning, and uh, I was actually swimming and was the mid-water about two meters over the top of the benthic diver on that. So, example of the fish survey being done, and uh, some habitat down at the bottom. Okay, thank you very much, Frankie, for that. All right, I believe I might have some time for questions. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I was wondering, I had a question about the first MDS plot that you showed. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit, I think the Trinidad point was pretty close to the middle region that you pointed out and how you grouped those sites together, but um, you'd mentioned that <coughs> you decided that that grouped out in a region with Pyramid Point. So I was wondering if you could explain kind of 
how you split Pyramid Point and Trinidad out as a region for a Sure, sure. No, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, visually, they look they look uh, similar to the the mid region on that plot I showed. Yeah, but um, in terms of the species that are present, they're much more similar to uh, the the far northern side of Pyramid Point. So, um, for example, that video clip you just saw, um, there's a lot of those big white matrivian anemones at both of those sites, Trinidad and the far northern Pyramid Point, and that's just one of several species that are more similar. So, so that's why we tended to group them together. It's not a it's really just a, a you know, just a, a nearest, na a somewhat near neighbor on that plot. I'll, I'll just put it that way. That's it's not a statistical statement. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Yeah. yeah, did you by any chance find any octopus in the drain ponds or in the surveys? And if so, did you? Um, that's a great question. I'll turn that over to our divers here. Uh, not very many. It's a, like octopus are really cryptic. Um, and I think if we were going to see them, you'd see them more at night and things like that. So octopus aren't really a good indicator for us on the dive surveys. I saw one. You saw yeah. one. one. One large octopus, and it was in Casper. It was in a huge cave kind of structured area below some boulders. But that was the only <coughs> octo I think we saw. OK, all the way in the back. Um, so for Caspar there, the density of abalone um, on that bar graph, yeah. um, was that a significant difference between the density of those two? Those bars were pretty close, I didn't see any error. Uh, no, no, there wasn't, that's right. So those bars were quite close, and what, we're, what Jonathan Santoni now is doing is really taking a much harder look at all of the individual transects and cell by cell, and seeing whether in fact, uh, on a cell by cell level, transect by transect, does the data always support the idea that the more urchins there are, the fewer abalone? So, so no, technically, there's no significant difference in that last, those last two bars. Uh, there is a significant difference at, at the shallower depth, or the 12 meter, the midwater depth, actually, and not at the shallower depth. So it's, it's a real like depth-specific kind of thing that's happening there. Um, that I'm trying to delve into deeper, but on uh, the whole site level, there's not a significant difference. <coughs> yeah, yes, one more question. Question regarding the red urchins that we saw in the last uh, frames. Uh, did you happen to get weights or examine the urchins to see if uh, the health of those urchins? Uh, oh, that's a good question. We do have data on the sizes of those red urchins. Uh, we actually also have some data from the urchin, some of the urchin harvesters who joined us to collect uh, data themselves as sort of the part of the uh, uh, assistance to, to us and, and, and uh, a part of the project that they were in charge with. Um, and all I can say at this point was that, yeah, there were lots of large, healthy reds, but those reds were um, not, you know, there wasn't any difference in sizes between MPA and non-MPA sites. Okay. So we, we did have, uh, we, like I said, we had sizes of uh, all of these urchins, but we did not take any weights. So it could have been that they uh, were, were large from previous years, but these years they, they had a relatively low gonadal uh, mass. Um, but, uh, and we, uh, we cracked open a couple of them while we were um, down there and the couple that we looked at in 2016 were fairly light on the gonads, so they uh, didn't really have much in them. Okay. At least the ones that we looked at, but we, we didn't do that really systematically throughout. Did you get any anecdotal stories from the harvesters? The, the harvesters were reporting a similar thing where they weren't seeing very much uh, at all in the way of gonads. Okay. 